This morning, I would like to discuss with you, I'd like to discuss with you a man who lived long, long ago. A man who worked with his hands and at one point became a traveling preacher. This man was often misunderstood, seen as a radical for his statements about and care for the poor. The religious elites of his time thought he was unfit to be a minister and sought to remove him from his position. And do you all know the man that I'm wanting to discuss? Come on, Sunday school answer. Wrong. It's Vincent Van Gogh. Yes, that Van Gogh. You see, Vincent Van Gogh's father and grandfather were pastors in the Dutch Reformed Church. And after a season of growing religious fervor, Vincent decided to become a pastor like his father and grandfather. I imagine most of us didn't know that. However, he failed the seminary entrance exam and decided he would take a three-month course at a Protestant missionary school in Brussels and failed out of that as well. Nevertheless, in 1879, he became a missionary of the Dutch Reformed Church, uh, sent to the area known as Wallonia, working in the Belgian coal mines. He was known for his radical generosity and hospitality, literally giving the shirt off of his back to those who needed it, and even giving his bed to those who were homeless. Van Gogh would regularly be seen throughout this town with no shirt, no shoes, and no service. That last one was a joke. <laughs> but, but the shirt and shoes part is actually quite serious. So much so that the baker that he was renting a house from, he would actually be on the top floor of this bakery, would regularly get into disagreements with his wife. So much so that Van Gogh was evicted from this house because the, wife, the baker's wife didn't like how Van Gogh was going about his ministry. You see, Van Gogh took it upon himself to care for the wounds of those who were injured in the mines. And the baker's wife didn't agree that Van Gogh should make his bandages out of her curtains, tablecloths, and linens. You know, slight disagreement. Again, he, he was a bit eccentric. Word about his eccentricity had spread and a minister from the Dutch Reformed Church was sent to visit him and sent a blistering report back, stating that Van Gogh's way of life was unbefitting the dignity of a minister. And so the church ended their support of him. His father was especially frustrated and advised that his son be committed to a nearby asylum for the mentally ill. At the age of 30 in 1883, he began pursuing a career as an artist, but again was mostly regarded as a failure until after he had died. You see, Van Gogh was a broken and complicated person, and so are we all. Vincent was disillusioned with the church, struggled with his faith, and took his own life at the very young age of 37. According to his brother Theo, Vincent's very last words will, what were, the sadness will last forever. Nevertheless, I believe that we can learn from Vincent today regarding one of his most famous paintings called The Sower at Sunset. Thank you, Tristan. You see, Van Gogh was deeply affected by a sermon he once heard on the parable of the sower. And because of this, he drew and painted more than 30 pieces of art with this theme. I think we have some samples of those 30 right up there. So today is not going to be about Vincent Van Gogh. It's going to be about Jesus. However, I do believe that through Vincent Van Gogh, and his work on the sower, we might gain a better understanding of what Jesus was trying to teach us. So would you pray with me as we, as we look at this text and this work of art together? Father, we ask today that you would be glorified. Not any of us in this room, not Vincent, just Jesus. Lord, help us to to look at this of art, so this text 
in a new way today. Work in our lives, we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. So turn in your Bibles with me. We are on page 865 of the Bibles in the chairs under your seats or in the uh, bookshelves up on the risers. If you don't have a Bible and you want one, please take that one. It is our gift to you. We're starting at verse 1 of chapter 8. Soon afterward, he went on through the cities and villages proclaiming and bringing the good news of the kingdom of God. So we need some background. If you weren't with us last week, Jesus has just come from the house of a man named Simon who was a Pharisee. If you're unfamiliar with what Pharisees were, they were an ancient Jewish sect that held very strict observance of the law and oral traditions. You see, Simon was a put together man. Meanwhile, a woman who was known for sin in the city came to Simon's house and began washing Jesus' feet with her tears, hair, and expensive ointment. This woman was not put together. Life had roughed her up. And yet, it was the woman who was roughed up that Jesus said would be saved. Keep reading with me. And the twelve were with him, and also some women who had been healed of evil spirits and infirmities. Mary called Magdalene, from whom seven demons had gone out, and Joanna, the wife of Husa, Herod's household manager, and Susanna, and many others who provided for them out of their means. You see, church tradition has often said that this woman, this woman who, who threw herself at Jesus' feet is the first woman mentioned in this ragtag group that Jesus assembled, Mary Magdalene. And I don't know what your Bible says in the section title above chapter 8, if you're looking there with me. Mine says, Women Accompanying Jesus. And I, I think that's actually just a ridiculous subtitle. The, te- the section title, if it says anything, should say, Women Financing Jesus. Because that's a more accurate depiction of, of what's going on if you read the text. This is Jesus' core group who he is traveling with. And the core group includes and is financed by women. And likely the one with the expensive ointment. Let's let's undo our categories there. Let's keep reading as well. Verse 4. And when a great crowd was gathering and people from town after town came to him, he said in a parable... A sower went out to sow his seed, and as he sowed, some fell along the path and was trampled underfoot, and the birds of the air devoured it. And some fell on the rock, and as it grew up, it withered away because it had no moisture. And some fell among thorns, and the thorns grew up with it and choked it. And some fell into good soil and grew and yielded a hundredfold. As he said these things, he called out, he who has ears to hear, let him hear. Now just imagine with me, would you? Imagine that you're, you're, you've been waiting for this moment. You all of a sudden hear that the Messiah is coming into town and you're like, okay, what is this great wisdom that we will gather from the Christ? Thousands are flocked to hear his words of wisdom. And instead of hearing the Christ, we all get introduced to Captain Obvious. I mean, if you took one semester of horticulture in high school or even gardened with your parents for just 10 minutes then you know you don't put seeds on walkways, rocks, or thorns. You sow seeds where the soil has been weeded and tilled. So again, the the crowds, they gather around Jesus to hear this majestic wisdom, and instead they get water is wet, fire is hot, snow is cold. Seeds should be planted in good soil. Tell me something I don't know. So keep reading with me. Verse 9. His his disciples asked him, "Um, what does this parable mean? I think the the women financiers and the 12 hear Jesus deliver this parable and immediately go over to check on him. So you okay, Jesus? (laughs) What was that about? And then Jesus said to them, to you, it has been given to know the secrets of the kingdom of God. But for others... They're in parables, so that seeing they may not see, and hearing they may not understand. You see, this verse is insanely important for the entirety of this text, and sometimes we overlook it. Don't miss it. If you've got a pen or a pencil, I would encourage you to just go over to the margin of your Bible and write in there Isaiah 6, 9 to 10. You see, it's, the, it's from the passage that Claire read for us earlier while we were singing. This is what Jesus is referring to. Isaiah 6, 9 to 10 records God telling the prophet Isaiah 
at the commissioning of his ministry to go and tell the people, be ever hearing, but never understanding. Be ever seeing, but never perceiving. Make the heart of this people calloused, make their ears dull and close their eyes. Otherwise they might see with their eyes, hear with their ears, understand with their hearts and turn and be healed. You see, Jesus is saying that his ministry is in the vein of this prophet, Isaiah. And he wants Mary, Joanna, Susanna, and the 12 to have Isaiah 6 in mind as they hear his interpretation of this parable. They are being commissioned, as verse 1 says, to proclaim and bring the good news of the kingdom. And just like Isaiah 6, they are told that that reception is going to be mixed and they should expect it to be. You see, there's a word that ties this entire section together that we we shouldn't miss. And maybe you've noticed it. Again, I want to encourage you, write, circle, underline, do whatever you got to do. Every time you see that word hear or heard in this section, that word hear is used nine times. Jesus is unpacking Isaiah 6 with this parable, telling us that some see, but do not see. Some hear, but they but they don't hear. So let's look at Jesus' and Jesus's interpretation. Verse 11. Now the parable is this. The seed is the word of God. Now that's key. The same word of God that the prophet Isaiah was told to preach to the people of Israel, a word of coming judgment and God's rescue through a Messiah, someone who according to Isaiah 53 would be pierced for our transgressions and crushed for our iniquities. That's the seed, the word of God that brings good news of his kingdom. This is the picture that Jesus is painting. Verse 12, the ones along the path are those who have heard, again, that's a circle. Then the devil comes and takes away the word from their hearts so that they might not believe and be saved. Now, the reality is when we urbanites think of paths, we tend to think of sidewalks. But that's not the image here. The, the path would have been something like what Van Gogh paints. Let's see if I got that. Oop, that is not working very well. I'm just going to go right over to it. How's that? It's something like what Van Gogh paints right here. It's a, a path that has been, that's neat and tidy, and it can't permeate the soil. So as the parable says, the birds come along and take it away. You'll notice the, the crows in Van Gogh's painting are, are flying and walking in the direction of the path. And Jesus says that, that these crows are actually the work of the devil. The actual word there in the original language is where we get the word diabolical from. The diabolical one comes and, and takes the word from their hearts. What, what Jesus is, is trying to explain to us and what he's trying to tell his disciples is that when they are sowing the seeds of God's word, what they are doing is engaging in spiritual warfare. It is a threat to the enemy. And I know when I, when I say the word spiritual warfare, for many of us, pops in our minds uh, this little image of a devil in, in red tights and horns or spinning heads and pea soup from the Exorcist movies. But that's exactly what the devil wants. He wants us either to think that he is stronger than he is and scarier than he is or that he is simply a Hollywood joke. But neither is true. You see, Satan's greatest delight does does not come in scaring and overwhelming you with his presence, but rather by undermining God's presence, undermining the seed of God's word that you sow. You see, the devil is a key saboteur of the seeds you sow, especially among those who, like a pathway, are cleaned up and tidy and have everything together. What the devil wants more than anything is for them to see the seed of God's word as something you might adorn yourself with, like a a golden cross necklace. It's an add-on, but not anything that, that truly transforms you from the inside out. They heard. Do you see that? The people, the, the, the seed was scattered on the path. They heard, but it's it's just nice music. It's a good and catchy chorus but there's no understanding of the lyrics or the message. 
You see, Jesus wants his disciples to understand why some people respond the way that they do to the gospel. And the reason he gives is there's a battle raging. You see, Vincent van Gogh was thought to have felt the pain of this battle as he's famous for for having cut off his left ear after believing he was hearing voices and wanted them to stop. Was, Was this demonic or a struggle with mental health or maybe a mixture of the two. You know, we we don't really know for sure, but we do know that he felt the crows looming behind him. And perhaps you feel the, the crows looming behind you or wherever it is that you are sowing seed. And so my word to you this morning, if that's you, pray, pray and keep sowing. Sowing the seed of God's word is a way in which we make war against the enemy, against the diabolical one. Keep sowing, keep praying. There are other seeds though. Verse 13, and the ones on the rock are those who, when they hear the word, receive it with joy, but these have no root. They believe for a while and in time of testing fall away. Don't forget that in in Jesus' parable, all of these seeds sprouted. They grew, but because of a lack of moisture, these ones, they, they withered. Again, the seed continues to be God's word. The sower is still the one who shares it, but the saboteur here is trials. You know, a few years ago, a friend of mine who I had discipled called me in tears to, to let me know that he was unsure if he was going to remain in the faith. He had recently given his life to Jesus, got engaged to a Christian woman, but the wedding preparations got kind of messy and he had hit some trials. And those trials brought anger and confusion. And he said, if God would treat him this way, he was out. I remember just being so confused. I mean, he was growing. What, what happened? Should I, should I have called him more? Should I have prayed with him more? Should I, have, should I have talked him through all of these things? And maybe you've been in that situation. You're like, Lord, what's going on? I've been, I've been trying to tell this person the beauty of the hope that they can have in Jesus Christ. And now there were no roots. Similarly, Vincent Van Gogh had, had experienced trials failures as an art dealer, failure of theological examination, firing as a missionary, struggling as an artist, and battling mental illness. He hit trials, and those trials culminated with the sudden loss of his father who had a heart attack. It was at this point that he completed this painting called Still Life with Bible. The Bible's open to Isaiah 53, and it's the Bible that belonged to, to his late father. Beside it was an extinguished candle symbolizing his lost faith. And below it was his own copy of a French novel called The Joy of Life, which would be his new guide. He was done. Testing had extinguished Vincent's faith in his own words. The word of God did not change, neither did the sower. But because of rootlessness, In trial, the plant, the plant fell away. Look at verse 14. And as for what fell among the thorns, they are those who hear, but as they go on their way, they are choked by the cares and riches and pleasures of life, and their fruit does not mature. You see, thus far, we've we've seen that those who think they have it all together and just want to add some Jesus are like those seeds on the path. Those who have been roughed up are like the seeds on the path. The rock. And here, the saboteur is quite different. It's not a tidy life. It's not a roughed up life. It's a lush life. You see, being free from from trials won't necessarily grant you greater faith and trust in God. In fact, it, it often has the opposite effect of granting greater faith in yourself and your circumstances. I mean, J.D. Rockefeller, who is the world's first billionaire, was once asked the question, how much will be enough? And he famously responded, just a little bit more. In 2021, when Elon Musk surpassed Jeff Bezos as the wealthiest person in the world, 
he, he told Forbes magazine that he was going to celebrate by sending the Amazon founder, Jeff Bezos, a silver medal and a statue, a giant statue of the number two. <laughs> Riches won't be enough. It'll never satisfy. You see, it doesn't matter how much money we have. We lie to ourselves, t- telling ourselves that, oh, if only we had this, if only we had a, a little bit more, then we would be content and our jealousy would cease. But the numerous tragic stories of those who have won the lottery prove otherwise. You see, maturity does not sprout from health and wealth gospel. The thorns might be adorned with roses, but they are still thorns. True maturity is rooted in the one who is pierced with a crown of thorns, who gave up the riches and pleasures of heaven, took on the cares of this world and died on a Roman cross so that we might be free and that we might grow. Friends, Vincent van Gogh did not sell a single painting to a non-relative until a few months before he died. And even this, even finally selling a painting did not undo his sadness. Look at verse 15. As for that in the good soil, they are those who hearing the word, hold it fast in an honest and good heart and bear fruit with patience. Now this is important. What is special, what is special about the, the good soil? What characterizes it? Do you see? They hold fast and bear fruit with patience. Said another way, They persevere. You might notice there's nothing really special about the good soil. There's not a single command in this parable or explanation. Jesus is not telling his disciples to do or be anything. He's simply saying that those who patiently hold fast, who persevere, will see fruit. It's not about us. It's not about what we do. All of them here, but not all will persevere. He goes on to say, look with me at verse 16. This is the end of our passage. No one after lighting a lamp covers it with a jar or puts it under a bed, but puts it on a stand so that those who enter may see the light. For nothing is hidden that will not be made manifest, nor is anything secret that will not be known and come to light. Take care then how you hear. For to the one who has, more will be given. And from the one who has not, even what he thinks that he has will be taken away. Then his mother and brothers came to him, but they did not reach him because of the crowd. And he was told, your mother and your brothers are standing outside desiring to see you. But he answered them, my mother and my brothers are those who hear the word of God and do it. You see, according to to Jesus... Attending church on Sunday, listening to Christian music, podcasts, or sermons will not be the source alone of your maturity. It's perseverance and obedience. So what do Jesus and Vincent van Gogh's parable and painting of the sower have to teach us? In studying the two, I believe that I've been taught three lessons that I want to share with you this morning. Three lessons that that these two men teach in tandem about how we are called to sow the seed of God's word. Lesson one, sow indiscriminately, not cautiously. You see, Van Gogh's field includes a, a path similar to the rocky ground in Jesus' story, as well as birds to snatch the seed away. And in the background, closest to the sun, is a field of mature grain ready for harvest. A variety of outcomes kind of appear possible. But the sower is undeterred. He strides confidently forward, throwing the seed and leaving the outcome to God. I mean, notice the sower's joyful posture in the painting. His right arm is extended in the act of scattering the seed and his right leg is stepping forward, ready for the next dispersion. The sower casts seeds without discrimination, teaching us to spread God's word generously without preconceived notions or biases. In in Jesus' parable, likewise, the the sower is scattering seeds in all sorts of places. You see, sometimes we, we think we know when the soil is just right. 
We should reach these kinds of people and not those kinds of people. Simon the Pharisee, remember from last week, he understands the law. The gospel of the kingdom for him will just be a cherry on top. Let's start with him. But in actuality, it was the woman who is known for her sin, who is most ready to receive the word of God. The one who looked all rocky and thorny, that was the soil that was tilled. Friends, we are called to indiscriminate sowing, not cautious selection. You see, too often we tell ourselves that one person is not broken enough or that another person is too broken for Christ to heal, but neither is the case. Friends, we are not called to be the growers. We are called to be the sowers. This brings me to my second lesson. Sow faithfully, not successfully. You see, this is a point that I hope you, I hope you would have heard. If you've been here at Park Near North for a while, I hope you would have heard this point many times in, in different ways. We are not responsible for the fruit or the success of our evangelism or our ministry. Friends, it's not about us. We are the sowers, not the growers. One of my favorite theologians was named Henry Nouwen. Uh, he once said it this way. He said, there is a great difference between successfulness and fruitfulness. Success comes from strength, control, and respectability. A successful person has the energy to create something, to keep control over its development, and to make it available in large quantities. Success brings many rewards and often fame. Fruits, however, come from weakness and vulnerability. And fruits are unique. A child is the fruit conceived in vulnerability. Community is the fruit born through shared brokenness. And intimacy is the fruit that grows through touching one another's wounds. We are not called to success, but to faithfulness. Interestingly, Van Gogh's sower is, is actually not, is not really his own. It's widely recognized that Van Gogh copied his sower and even his posture from a more successful artist named Jean-Francois Millet. Millet's painting was in no way influenced by Jesus's parable, but was rather about the unidealized depiction of a peasant's strength and hardworking lifestyle. Van Gogh took this image of Millet's peasant sower to communicate the posture the sower takes in the parable, as you look there. He's a hired hand. Likewise, my friends, we are invited into God's work, not the owners of it. Interestingly, Van Gogh's sower differs from Malay's in one major way, scale. You see, Malay's painting was 40 inches high and the sower filled the entire frame. Van Gogh's sower neither fills the canvas nor dominates the composition. Instead, his painting is dominated by a radiant yellow sun, his symbol for God's presence and love. It is Christ who fills Van Gogh's painting rather than the sower in the field. You see, sometimes like Malay's painting, we overestimate our power and our importance. But our calling is to have our right arm extended to scatter seed and our right leg stepping forward, ready for the next dispersion. We are called to be the sowers, not the growers. Again, Isaiah 6, preach this word, but remember, they're not all gonna hear. They're not all gonna understand because it's not about you. Most of the seeds sown by Jesus' sower reap no fruit at all, but this did not make that sower faithless. We're called to be faithful, not successful. And one last lesson from Jesus and Vincent, if you would. Lesson three, sow in the background, not the foreground. You see, for those of you who are here and have studied art, and I know we have quite a few artists in the room I'm so grateful for, you know of something called color theory. 
a rule of color theory that was taught in Van Gogh's day and still taught in, in art schools today is that if you're drawing a scene, especially a landscape, you want to put the warm colors in the front and the cool colors in the back. Think of a painting that maybe you've seen of a landscape with mountains in the background. The mountains, the mountain peaks, kind of have that cool blue tone at the top. This was taught, again, in Vincent's day and in our day. But as you likely notice in this painting, Van Gogh broke the rules. The background is the foreground, and the foreground is the background. The bright colors are not in the foreground. They're in the background. The sower and the field are important, but that's not where the action is. Yes, the, the sower is, is scattering, but the most important action comes from the shining sun. That's where the warmth is found. That's the grower, the light. The light that goes unhidden, not placed under a jar or a bed, but made public for all to see indiscriminately, faithfully, and in the foreground where it belongs. Can you play the background? I think that's a question we have to wrestle with. If we're seeking to follow Christ, if we're seeking to be the faithful sower, can you play the background? Maybe the seed of God's word has, has grown and blossomed in you. Are you willing to play the background and, and sow the seed planted in you indiscriminately, faithfully, and putting the light in the foreground rather than yourself? Jesus says, my mother and my brothers are those who hear the word of God and do it. Who are you? What about you who are still unsure? The seed of God's word is being scattered all around you, but you're not sure it's penetrating. Jesus' word to you today is in verse 18. Take care then how you hear. For to the one who has, more will be given. And from the one who has not, even what he has will be taken away. Friends, recognize the soil of your life. And don't just hear God's word, but receive it. You know, in a few moments, we're going to be taking of the Lord's Supper together. And perhaps today is the day that you will receive the word of God for the first time. And take of the Lord's Supper, having called out to Jesus in faith, hearing his word and giving your life to do it. Vincent Van Gogh's tumultuous and short journey through life really does serve as a sober reminder for us. Amidst the, myth, amidst the turmoil of his existence, Van Gogh's pursuits led him deeper into the abyss of despair. It's a haunting reminder of the perils of neglecting the soul's cry for salvation and redemption. Yet amidst the darkness that shrouded his existence, there remains a glimmer of hope, a call to turn to Jesus Christ for salvation. Just as Jesus beckoned the weary and burdened to find rest in him, so too does he extend his hand to those in the depths of despair, offering the promise of peace and redemption. Friends, as we reflect on Van Gogh's tragic legacy, let's heed the call to take care how you hear and turn to Jesus where we might find refuge for our weary souls. Church, Yesterday, I was with my family at the Art Institute downtown where I could, I could see that first painting that we looked at, the self-portrait of Van Gogh up on the wall. And as I looked at it and just saw Van Gogh's own image of his eyes, all I could think was how the church failed him. We did. He was suffering. He was battling. And people gave up on him. Let's not do that. Let's not give up on those who are suffering. Let's sow the seed and keep sowing, faithfully trusting that we are not the growers. We are the sowers. Are you here today? 
Are you here today and just kind of struggling? You're like, yeah, I just I feel like people have given up on me. We will not give up on you. Get plugged in. Be a part of our community and know that we will keep sowing. We will stand with you. Don't give up because Van Gogh said the sadness will never end. Those were his last words. And friends, the sadness does end. You need to know that truth today. You must know that the sun will rise and the day will come when death and despair and sadness will be no more. Every tear will be wiped away, says Jesus. That is our promise in Revelation 21. The day will come when the sun will set on this world and the sun will rise on anew. Do you desire that? Turn, turn to him today. Let the word be, be sown deep in your soil of a heart. Call out to him with me. Would you join me now in prayer? Father, we ask that you might work in our heart today. Give us ears to hear, eyes to see, so that we might be those who you would call mothers and brothers, sisters, sowing seeds, wherever it is that you send us. For those of us who, who are still struggling, maybe we've given up on ourselves or given up on others. We've said, well, I'm just the rocky soil. I'm just a, a batch of thorns. I've got my life together. I don't, I don't need an add-on. Lord, help us to continue to wrestle and to hear, to know that you are still sowing and calling us to sow indiscriminately, that it's never too late to put hope in the one where sadness will find its end. Be glorified now in our presence, in our worship, in our testimony. We ask in Jesus' name, amen.